Hi guys, and welcome back to my channel. I'm super excited to have you back here with me today because today is another story time series where I'm gonna be telling you about my experience in Angola. Now I realize that this should actually be Andorra, but uh, well, alas, here we go. Andorra will have to come next. And I think you're gonna enjoy this one. So without further ado, let's dive in. <laughs> Angola is a southern African nation. It has the South Atlantic Ocean to the west, and it is surrounded by Namibia, Zambia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Angola is predominantly Christian, also Catholic and Protestant, and surprise, they speak Portuguese, so pretty interesting country. It's definitely had its fair share of problems over the years, especially when you're going into the bush and kind of more inland. However, Luanda is not a bad place to visit and is relatively safe, in my opinion at least, though when I was there, I was kind of told otherwise, but I think they're just always looking out for you, especially when you're a young blonde girl traveling around South Africa. I experienced quite a few issues before I get into that with getting my visa. For Angola, you need to have a letter of invitation of, or a visa request letter. You need to have a you know, plane ticket, copy of your hotel reservation, yellow fever vaccination, a money order, the application, and I can't re recall if I needed to have that LOI letter of invitation notarized. I do remember that I I had to go to the Angola Embassy in Washington, D.C. And <sighs> I hate to be negative, but this is kind of the <sighs> negative things that happen when you're traveling. There were not a lot of tour agencies that were actually functioning at the time of when I was visiting Angola. And I had to ensure that I received that letter of invitation from a tour agency. Typically, you have to book a tour and they'll give you a letter of invitation, which then you take to the embassy, including your application and whatnot. What I would do is a lot of times since those tours in Africa, a lot of the tours that, that people will go on will be a week or, or more. They're definitely gonna be at least four days, most of them. They're gonna be a good significant amount of time. And I unfortunately didn't have the time or the budget to book like, they're very expensive in Africa. So it's like a week tour could be like four grand. It could be two grand. I mean, 500 bucks I think would be like maybe a two day tour. They're pretty expensive. And I just didn't have the budget for that as well or the time. And I wasn't there to really like go on tours. This wasn't like a selfish expedition around the world. This was meeting with students and ministers of tourism and trying to break Guinness World record and that also was like to get the sponsors for the humanitarian mission you, you guys get the point by now so I ended up finding a tour operator that was functioning and I reached out to obtain a letter of invitation now a lot of the times these tour operators will issue you a letter of invitation even if you don't book a tour with them but a lot of the times they'll actually charge you for that letter of invitation even though they're just like writing something down I get it they need to make money but they'll charge you I, I've gotten charged you know anywhere from $250 for a letter of invitation even though I didn't do the tour with the company. Uh, the company knew that I was going to be coming to that country and they had to inform the, the embassy. Essentially, they're kind of, they're not liable for you, but they are recommending that you can come into the country and they're recommending you. So it's like, they do have to kind of have a little bit of liability in that sense as well. So <laughs> there's this really terrible tour operator who I didn't know was going to be so bad. I mean, this guy was like from the UK and he lived and worked in Angola and he moved there to like start his own tour company. And he was probably like in his mid fifties, I want to say. I had all good intentions and I was preparing on having a great trip and paying him for the letter of invitation unless I could do a quick tour with him, like a day tour, but he wasn't offering anything quick because his tours would involve going into the bush and there was a lot of resources that were needed in order to do that safely. So he said it, there was no way that we could do like a one day or two day tour. And so he said he would provide the letter of invitation and I paid him, let me look up on my email here. I paid him $160 for the letter of invitation and he was to send that letter of invitation to to the Angola Embassy in DC. I took a break from my expedition and this I had to do quite a bit for the visas to physically go to the embassy and provide them the application in person. I mean, a lot of these countries were like that and it's like I, I couldn't just send it and I had to go there in person. And Angola was one of those countries and he said he had sent it to them the letter of invitation, which he couldn't send to me because then you, you could write it yourself. So they, the tour operator has to send it to the embassy. So he said he sent it. I, I went there. I said, did you receive it? And she said, no. 
We didn't receive any letter of invitation. And I said, okay, like what? Uh, are you kidding me? And I emailed him, but he didn't get back to me in time. And long story short, he was really shady. He just wanted to take my money, which kind of classic travel story, I guess. She was really nice, this woman at the, at the embassy. She was so nice. And she said, you know, actually you don't need a letter of invitation. You're here in person and you just have to like get something notarized yourself. You can do it yourself and you need to have like proof of where you're gonna be staying the hotel. I think we can call the hotel and confirm that you're staying there and whatever. It was something like that. I don't remember the exact details, but she ended up saying, no, no, you're fine. You don't, you don't actually need it. This is how it goes in some of these countries. They just kind of like wing it sometimes. And I'm not sure what they do or what they're thinking. Or maybe if you're there in person, I swear to God for Pakistan, I had to go to the embassy in New York at least five or six times on separate occasions to keep, to keep checking in. And it was only after they saw my face time and time again. And I made friends with everyone at the embassy and like, brought them treats. I feel like I brought them like uh, little cupcakes once that they finally were like, okay, we're gonna issue this to you. And I was actually, I think it was through the meetings with Minister of Tourism and that I was able to do that. So finally I got to Angola and I'm gonna pull up my journal here and see what happened. You know, and I didn't really keep track of where I stayed a lot of times. It didn't really matter, honestly. I wasn't promoting the hotel and I did wanna keep on the DL, like since I was traveling solo to all these places. So I didn't even like really note them in here a lot of the hotels that I stayed in, it didn't really matter. But here I said I stayed at the Roxanol Luxury Guest House in Luanda. Now, this guest house was definitely subpar. It's okay though. I mean, the people there were were nice and helpful. They were Europeans who owned it at the time. I don't know if they still. And I felt like I didn't have a lot of privacy. Like there were always people kind of like knocking or calling or something. I was in Angola from September 18th to September 19th, 2016. So I was only there for one day again. I, I'm not gonna lie, like I didn't do too much. <laughs> I ended up going grocery shopping and the staff, I just remember them telling me, yeah, the people at the front desk were really nice, but they advised me not to go out alone. So when I asked them where to get shampoo, since I ran out, they went and got it themselves. So I don't know why they didn't think it was safe for me to go out alone. Alas, they dropped off some shampoo for me, which I paid for and all that. But I ended up going out to uh, walking around the city. Like I told you, I like to do one thing in every country around the world that I travel to, be it big or small, but one memory that I can take with me and that I can really get an idea about that country and the people and the place and just try to immerse myself in it as much as possible given the limited time that I usually had in a place. So I decided to go to a grocery store and grab some groceries. I got my typical baguette, a brick of cheese, apple, a tomato, just the basic, basic little things that I could just munch on, maybe take it somewhere or just for my room to save money. I went to check out at the grocery store. My card didn't work and I had had one credit card with me that I primarily traveled on this expedition. It was the Chase Ultimate rewards so I could get free flight with my points and whatnot. I was on a budget, like I was on a really strict budget. So I had only a certain amount in my bank account that I could spend. It was very, very strict and strategic with how I planned out my budget when I traveled to each country. I'd already spent a lot of money for that visa and it took a lot of, like I don't even think the guy refunded me. He might've finally refunded me the 160, but I had to go through loopholes and hire an attorney. Probably wasn't worth it to get the 160 back. But guys, listen, if you are traveling every country in the world and you're getting ripped off continuously Continuously, I could have ended up losing $10,000 over the course of that expedition around the world because of how many tour operators ripped me off. You have to really pay attention to that stuff and you have to fix the problem. You can't just be like, oh, well, you know, there goes another 200 to a sleazy tour operator who gets to keep the cash or whatever. And no matter how meticulous you are with planning these visas and LOIs, sometimes all you can do is like send them money and hope that they ride that LOI to the embassy. There's really nothing more you can do because it's such a developing country and they just don't have the tools to, to really ensure that you get what you pay for sort of thing. It's just really challenging in some countries. Anyways, I was really kind of concerned why my card wasn't working. I'm gonna break it to you now. It ended up being the fact that Chase and I hated this. They put a fraud on my card. I didn't have international data in Angola for some reason. And so I wasn't able to fix it right then and there. But it, a lot of the times this happens so much where they call fraud because I was going to a new country. Sometimes I didn't have enough time to call and let them know before I entered that country. And even if I did, sometimes I'd still do fraud. And I remember I had a Bank of America card too. I might have used that debit card. Again, these little details, like I don't jot, I didn't jot down or anything. Bank of America was really bad with that fraud stuff. I said, okay, well, 
well, I think I'm just gonna return these groceries and not get any, it's okay. Like I didn't make a big deal out of it because it was kind of embarrassing, honestly. I think we've all been there once, it's definitely embarrassing. But the guy behind me, really nice guy, very, very sweet guy, and he spoke English, which they speak Portuguese in Angola, so I was really kind of surprised, and he said, I'll pay, I'll pay for your groceries. I said, no, it's okay, you know, you don't have to pay for my groceries. He ended up paying for my groceries, like he wouldn't take no for an answer, and sometimes when people won't take no for an answer, you kind of just have to let them do it. Like you have to, you know, and I've been there before where people have said no to me and I'm like, please, you know, and I, I do it, I have to do it. And you just have to like, cause it makes them feel good about it. He's like, you know, just give back in the future, give back to someone else. And I've done that tenfold. So I took it back to my hotel. I was just like taken aback with how kind the people in Angola were. Despite the tour operator who really gave me a different impression about Angola. Granted, he wasn't from Angola, he was from the UK. So I shouldn't have let that affect me, but I went into Angola thinking I've tried so hard to get here and it's been such a stressful experience. But the people there were really, really kind. And yeah, I ended up having a, a nice time in Angola. Well guys, that's it for this story time. I hope you enjoyed. And if you've been to Angola, please let everyone know in the comments below what was your favorite place? What was the favorite, your favorite thing that you did there? I want to know, other people want to know if you have any tips when it comes to traveling to Angola, please let us know in the comments below. Also be sure to like this video as it really, really supports my channel. And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and hit that notification bell to get notified when I post new videos. And I will see you guys in the next story time. Andorra. Bye.